Hello and welcome back to Ripley's Aquarium of Canada Conservation Conversations. My name is Katie. I'm the manager of education here at the aquarium and uh, all through the spring we have been conducting interviews with uh, community partners and researchers on a variety of topics. Today I'm being joined by Alex Price, who is the acting liaison biologist for the Asian Carp Program that's under Aquatic Invasive Species Ecosystems Management with uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Welcome, Alex. Thanks so much for joining us. Tell us all about the Asian carp. Hi, Katie. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so uh, like Katie mentioned, I'm the acting liaison biologist with uh, the Asian carp program with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Uh, Asian carps is a, is a group term which includes uh, big head carp, silver carp, grass carp, and black carp. And uh, these fish pose a significant threat to the ecosystems and economy of the Great Lakes and Canadian waters. The Government of Canada, recognizing this risk, developed the Asian Carp Program in 2012, and it was based on two critical components. Uh, the first, blocking their spread, and the second, preventing people from bringing live individuals into Canada. The program started very small with just two staff members, but has since grown to over 10 permanent staff. And uh, we routinely hire up to 15 seasonal staff with uh, 12 to 14 of those being uh, summer students. And each year we have up to five field crews who sample th around 36 uh, high risk tributaries and wetlands across the Canadian side of the Great Lakes Basin. And uh, just some more details. Since the program's inception, 29 grass carp have been captured in Canadian waters by commercial fishermen, anglers, and field crews. Uh, but there have been no captures or recorded sightings of silver carp, big head carp, or black carp in Canadian waters since the program began in 2012. And while finding grass carp in Canadian waters is a cause for concern, there is no evidence that these fish have reproduced. So really the time to act it is now to prevent them from establishing themselves in the Canadian waters. Uh, so that's one side of the program. It's uh, very much early warning and surveillance and detection based. And the other part of the program, which I'm currently working with, is focused on creating outreach and educational materials to provide more information and guidance to the public. Um, and we also work with a multitude of partners, such as the invasive Species Center, uh, which leads and runs AsianCarp.ca. They run multi multiple social media campaigns, info sessions, and webinars each year, as well as work with social media influencers. Uh, another main partnership that, that we have is with Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, and they, they take the lead on the invaded, Invading Species Hotline, as well as the EdMaps uh, mobile application for reporting invasive species. Um, they also, pre-COVID, had a high presence at trade shows, grad school presentations, and uh, uh, social media campaigns as well. Uh, one other partnership that I wanted to mention is Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. And they assist with uh, our field work as well as outreach in the Toronto area and its tributaries. And we also have uh, many other partners who provide outreach and educational materials to different water users in targeted areas. So for, for people that aren't familiar with uh, grass carp in particular, can you tell us a little bit more about what, what will we notice about them? Why are they so scary for, for the Great Lakes? Yeah, sure. Gra grass carp are, are large body fish. They can, they can get up to one and a half meters long and weigh over hundred pounds. And uh, the reason why they are such an imminent threat is they, um, they, they have a presence on, in, in the United States side of, of Lake Erie. And we, they're the one fish that we've caught multiple of since the program started. Um, it, only, it, can, it can take only 20 individuals to significantly impact uh, an ecosystem and successfully reproduce and create an established population. So it's, really important that um, we're out there um, doing early detection and surveillance for them to ensure that we are are capturing any that are that could be in the waters. I think this image really illustrates like the numbers are impressive but like this is a big fish. 
Yeah, this is a large, large body fish. Um, the picture on the screen here is one that we caught last year during our third day of sampling. And um, because of COVID, we weren't able to get out onto the water until uh, about a month later than when we typically get out. And uh, this was the day after Canada Day in, in Jordan Harbor. And we caught that using a combination of sampling techniques that we, that we typically use, uh, electrofishing and trammel netting. So in this fish resulted in us having a five day response plan where we had three crews uh, doing targeted sampling, which means that we were, we were going to uh, habitats that were high probability of having a fish, lots of woody debris, lots of vegetation in the shallower waters and, and, and really doing intense sampling to make sure if any other fish are in the area that we, we have the greatest chances of capturing them. So, I mean, these all invasive species kind of share a few characteristics, right? They reproduce like crazy, they eat everything, and they don't typically have predators. Is that the same for the grass carp? Yeah, the grass carp doesn't have many predators other than when they're in their juvenile life stages, but they are, they grow very rapidly. So they, they, um, become less enticing to our natural predators very quickly in their in their life stages. And, and once they're large bodied, like the one that's pictured here that was also caught in Jordan Harbor, uh, they virtually have no predators. So they're able to reign free and they, they, they outcompete our native fishes for food. Um, they also are ferocious eaters. They can, they can eat up to 40% of their body weight of vegetation each day which it wouldn't take long for a couple fish of this size to, to, to really degrade a, 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 a wetland. Oh, no kidding. So like, do you know how old these ones would be? Like how long does it take them to get to this huge size? Um, I don't know the specific ages of each of these fish, but I know um, within their first couple of years of life, they can grow very large up to, up, up, up to two feet or so. So it, it's, they grow very rapidly and, and, and uh, they're ferocious, ferocious eaters. How did you get involved with this work? Um, I always loved the outdoors as a, as a kid, fishing, boating with my dad, uh, really liked going on hikes. And I, I was always really interested in all the different fish species uh, around my house. And, and my parents used to take my sister and I out, out to the local creek and, you know, you'd see the minnows swimming around in the larger fish. And I, I always had a, a, a passion for um, learning more about them. So I uh, graduated from high school and took a year off and worked because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And uh, I was searching the web one night and I found Sir St. for Fleming College and their Fish and Wildlife Technician Technology Program. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. I love fishing. I love the outdoors. I love wildlife. I, I, I love animals and helping animals. So I I signed up and, and went there for three years and then ended up transferring to Trent University to get my honors uh, in, in biology. And uh, when I was at Sir Stanford Fleming, I was looking for, for summer jobs and came across the Federal Student Work Experience Program. And uh, I went through that competition and it, it's a program that Fisheries and Oceans implements to help students gain relevant work experience while they're going through school. So um, I ended up being hired with the Species at Risk Science section with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. I, I worked with this program for three years as a summer student. And uh, when I graduated from university, um, they brought me on as one of their technicians in, in 2012. And, and so I worked with them uh, with many different species at risk. And, and in 2016, I I had the opportunity to transfer to the Asian Carp Program, and I've been I've been working with that program ever since. And you still get to go out in the field, which is what yeah. most people just like, right? You got to do the <laughs> stuff too, but going out in the field <laughs> is what everyone really gets into the field for. So. Yeah, I mean it's a lot of fun, and it's it really when you're passionate about something, it's not really a job, and you know, in the field and, and catching a lot of different fish species and and 
having the feeling like, you know, you're really making a difference and, and protecting and conserving our biodiversity. It's, it's a really great feeling. Awesome. So you said so far, we think we're getting all the Asian carp before they get to a point where they're reproducing in our system. So we're doing a good job so far, but worst case scenario, what if we aren't able to keep track of all these Asian carp entering the Great Lakes system uh, and remove them, what kind of consequences would we be looking at in the long term? Um, so, so like I mentioned before, the Asian carp pose a significant threat to our waters. All four species grow very rapidly and uh, get to very large sizes, uh, some up to 100 pounds and even over 100 pounds and over one and a half meters in, in, in length. Uh, these fish are ferocious eaters. They, they, they're capable of consuming up to 40% of their body weight in food each day. And in fact, they eat so much food that a large proportion of the food they consume cannot be completely digested, digested, which creates a lot of waste and undigested food to enter into, into the water's excrement. And all of this undigested excrement in the water can cause the water to become higher in nutrients and, and can cause really severe blue-green algae blooms, which is really dangerous to humans, pets, livestock, and, and, and any animal that comes in contact with the contaminated water. So that's one uh, really significant impact that would affect um, not only humans, but also our, our native wildlife. Um, grass carp in particular, uh, eat enough vegetation to significantly decrease the amount of vegetation in our wetlands and shorelines, which, it, which is critical habitat for many bird species, for, for nesting habitat, uh, protection habitat, food resources for our duck species. Um, so it can really impact our, a lot of our migratory birds as well. Um, these shoreline wetland habitats are also used by native fish communities for nursery habitats, as, as well as cover protection habitat for juvenile fishies. And uh, um, it, 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 when, if these fish are able to introduce themselves and, and persist, it will degrade the habitat over time and it will end up having decreased biodiversity of, our, of, of fish and animal species in our waterways. We'll also have decreased water quality, um, which, which greatly affects us all. So it's important that, that we, are active in, in managing and making sure that these fish aren't able to um, be introduced and, and, and persist and spread throughout our waterways. Did you say it, was, it would be as few as 20 that could cause that for, of takeover? Yeah, for grass carp, it's as few as 20 species can actually, uh, is actually all that they need to be um, successful in reproducing. So it's really not that many fish. So. It's, yeah. uh, it's an imminent threat to our waterway right now. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So for people watching, what, what kinds of things should we be aware of? What, what can we do to help? Yeah. yeah, the public play a critical role in helping to prevent the introduction of Asian curbs into Canada. Um, they provide more eyes on the water and, and what they can do is, you know, really learn to identify and tell the differences between Asian curb Asian carps and common lookalike species, such as common carp and buffalo. Um, they, they can also learn how to report any sightings or captures of potential Asian carps through either the invasive species hotline or uh, edmaps.com slash Ontario mobile application. Um, some other keys for the public would be to not trade, buy, or sell Asian carps unless they're dead and eviscerated. And, and, and that's uh, policy that's been handed out um, and don't release un unwanted pets or bait fish back into the water. Uh, you want to release bait fish far enough away from the water's edge, usually around 30 meters to, in to ensure that those, those fish can't make their way back into the water and, um, and introduce themselves into an environment where they may not have naturally came from. Right. And that's true for all invasive species, right? Things like cleaning your boat and not releasing pets are important for regardless of where you live to yep. an invasive species from taking hold anywhere. Yep, and that can even mean um, between water bodies within Ontario or within local waterways. Uh, we have lots of inland isolated, isolated waters that can easily be invaded by species that are already in, in the Great Lakes Basin. So it's important 
for anglers and for the public, you know, whether you're kayaking or paddle boarding or, or on a pleasure boat to make sure that you thoroughly dry the boat and um, make sure that there's no resident vegetation or anything that could be transferred to another body of water. And I think what, I mean, we're at the, a good stage right now with the grass carp where we know that they're not in our systems, but once they're in, invasive species are next to impossible to eradicate, right? So that's why it's so important to invest the time and resources now to prevent them from getting in. Yes, we're at, we're at a stage right now where the cost to manage is equal to the, to the output and results that we're given. If, if we allow these fish to come in and we don't actively pursue keeping them out, uh, the, the cost benefit exponentially goes up. So it's really important right now to make the efforts to control these species before they're, before they're introduced into our waters and, and start spreading. Okay, great. So you mentioned a few websites where people can go to learn more. So that was mm -hmm. asiancarp.ca, was that right? Yep, Asian, asiancarp.ca. And there's uh, a couple social media accounts as well that the in, in Invasive Species Center manages, uh, Instagram and a YouTube page. And Fisheries Notions Canada has a YouTube page as well where they post videos, uh, not only on Asian carp, but other um, programs and what they do as well. So. Uh, there are many different resources for the public you can go to gain more information on Asian carps, uh, how to identify and prevent the introduction and spread of Asian carps. Uh, the main one is asiancarps.ca. It's a web page dedicated to the four Asian carp species, um, as well as as well as those social media accounts. Um, this is one of the infographics that uh, the outreach side of the Asian carp program produced, and it's available online, and it, it helps ex explain the threat uh, that grass carp in particular have on our waterways. And you can tell by the two uh, graphics on the left, uh, a healthy and balanced ecosystem has lots of different species. It has clean water. It, ha it has lots of vegetation and different fish species. But it, it, if these fish are able to come in and persist, you can see it reduces habitat for fish and, fish and birds and increases algae blooms, which can be very toxic to, to all animal species, including ourselves. Uh, it can decrease biodiversity twofold and uh, increase water murkiness and, and reduce aquatic plant species. So um, it's really important for all of us to, to act now. And uh, the map on the left are some high risk areas where grass carp have been seen or have been captured by uh, commercial fishermen or field crews or, or uh, um, an angler. And that spread there at the bottom too from 1970 to 2018, just how they've taken over in the US. We definitely don't want that to happen here. No, we don't want that to happen here. And that's fairly quick for a species to spread over over 30 or 40 years, that's that's a large area for that that species to cover. So yeah. Okay. Anything else you'd like those watching to to know about what they can do to help or yeah, of course. Uh, whether you're fishing, kayaking, walking on the shore, or, or just hanging out in your dock, you can make a difference by reporting these fish if you spot them. Uh, tips from the public are, are really essential to helping us um, manage and, and protect our waterways. And the more people that we have out there, the more eyes on the water, the better chance we have of finding and, and, and removing these fish. So if you, if you do see or catch a grass carp, please report it. And the, the invading species hotline is 1-800-563-7711. Awesome. And also, and also um, stay tuned because we are gonna have a new Asian carp uh, grass carp featured exhibit at Ripley's Aquarium of Canada. For joining us, Alex, it was a pleasure chatting with you and thanks everyone for watching. We'll be bringing you more of these conservation conversations over the next few weeks. So stay tuned to our YouTube channel for more. Thanks so much.